Hello and welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit exploring pathways to more healthy and regenerative cultures. I'm Eva Schoenfeld and I'm here with Sophie Banks, who are introduced in week one, uh, has been with us through week two and now we're at week three, um, looking at the more kind of uh, the, the nitty gritty of uh, ways in which we can we can deal with uh, process and transform conflict. Um, so, Sophie, you were going to talk in this section about your experience, sort of to begin with, anyway, of of, of when someone gets called in, when someone like you gets called in to a conflict, and that's usually quite far down a fairly unpleasant road for the people who who call you in. So, so what's what's normally gone on for them? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I want to say I'm, you know, I'm not a full time conflict facilitator. It's one of the things that I yeah. sometimes get asked to do. Uh, mm. And I feel like I've learned some really important principles from people who are much more experienced than I am. Mm. Um, but in terms of, you know, offering to this summit uh, or this, com- you know, this online conference, just wanting to share a bit of, of that experience. Yeah. Um, so I guess for me, the heading would be about facilitating conflict. Um, and I think even that word facil- facilitating and facilitation, I think, is a really in- interesting kind of principle for this bit of the of the landscape of conflict. conflict. Um, there's a lovely story that I read somewhere about uh, someone in Tibet seeing two people arguing in the street and a 12-year-old boy going up to them and offering to help them with their conflict. And in that culture, people really understood the importance of having a facilitator, you know, a third person mm-hmm. when you're stuck in something. And for me, that's a beautiful little image of a healthy culture around conflict is when we're stuck in this um, dynamic, it's very difficult to get out of it on our own. And we need this third position. Um, and, and one of the lovely movements that I learned in when I was doing family constellations work is is the movement that goes from this where we're where we're facing each other and in this we tend to project all kinds of things and I've turned you into that person who did that thing to me and behaved like this you know all of those projections are going both ways we're both triggered somewhere into our past I think a really helpful understanding around conflict is there's always a sense of threat about threat of identity or safety or security or or belonging, whatever it is. And there's a movement that we can do where instead of being like this, we say, okay, let's step out of this dynamic and look like this. Mm. And together we're going to look at the dynamic that's going on between these two parts of ourselves that have got really stuck. Mm. So so even within within a conflict um, that's like this, if we can find that witness part of ourselves to go, stop, you know, stop, let's let's get some ground. Um, a week ago, 10 minutes ago, a year ago, I thought this person was okay, you know, maybe. How can we come to this place? So there's something for me about, um, and in a way that's what we're trying to get people to do uh, any of us that are working as conflict facilitators is to interrupt this war that's going on and invite the adult witnessing reflective part of people to step out of being caught in the dynamic to take a bigger perspective on what's going on. Um, And I think it's good to name, you know, we spoke about it a lot in the week one session that I did about the landscape of trauma. Um, and how underneath this charged interaction that's going on between people will be layers of wounding or trauma or history that are being triggered by something in this current interaction. So, you know, it may be, you know, that you said something that just was like that thing that somebody, you know, that that person who abused me or abandoned me or whatever sounded like, but it may also be you know, something about um, a dynamic to do with 
white people, black people, and a history of oppression and colonialism to do with that, or gender and men and women, where something's been touched, it's got a much bigger perspective. So having that kind of map of, you know, it, it's not just personal, there may be organisational dynamics, there may be cultural dynamics going on um, in this, you know, whatever's alive between us. Um, so I've spoken about that map, this kind of map of layers. So often when I'm doing an organisational um, facilitation, I'll put a map that says there's the organisation with its mission, its culture, its its uh, its life stage, and its founders, and all of those four things have a major influence on the dynamics that people get caught in, which may almost be nothing to do with them. Um, right. You know, and and you know, speaking about rank, the more rank you have. Sometimes the more power you have to not get involved in the conflict and you can somehow shove it off so that other people are engaged in the painful, messy business and it looks like it's them, but actually there's something about the founders or the, you know, the power structure or some other aspect of the organisational structure and culture that's, that's not working. Uh, so part, I want to say, isn't it, at this stage, part of conflict is the enormous complexity that we're dealing with personal timelines, organisational timelines, cultural timelines, layers and layers of identity and trauma and relationship. Um, you know, it's an enormously complex field. Uh, and Again, I'm going to quote Dominic Bart. I think he's so helpful. He said, the best guide to that landscape is feeling, is emotion. And I think that's part of why we have feelings, why emotions evolved, is to bring us back into relationship and to cause us pain and suffering when we're out of relationship. Mm -hmm. And again, this whole bit in our culture of losing access to our pain in particular uh, and, and having a dysfunctional relationship to it when it's present um, is part of our, I think there's a real illiteracy about relationship. And, and part of that is we don't know how to repair relationships often. And usually because in our family, when relationships were damaged, they weren't repaired. Mm -hmm. and our generations going back of carers and parents may not have known how to say sorry or how to mend. And we just had the children, just had to deal with the consequences. Mm. Yeah. So, so is it useful to talk about, you know, what may happen in the room? I, I, I guess there's that there's that kind of gesture of of let's look at this together, and it, you know, in the in in situations that you have facilitated. Have there been techniques that you've used um, or frameworks that you've brought to that help people do that? Because it's, you know, it, it's that kind of essential movement that you were talking about in week one, out of that state of oh, not coping, being in the, the kind of like the belly of the beast of, of not coping, out, back out onto kind of having some ground and being able to be in a kind of, you know, more adult place that can see more of the picture that knows that that person isn't actually your mother and whatever else. So, so how how are the things that you know that of that that facilitate that stepping out of the mess in onto the ground? You know, but keep people in connection so that they can actually reflect on what the hell was going on there. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I I want to just zoom back a little bit and let's. Uh, I'll come to that specific bit of it. Mm. Um, and I just want to speak as somebody who gets invited in sometimes to facilitate conflict when it's got to that stage of, of, of usually of threat to either people's belonging or to the organisation as a whole. Um, so it's pretty desperate. One of the expectations is that you can bring an expert in and somehow they'll weave a bit of magic and and it'll it'll go away um, but usually by the time we've got to this stage actually positions are pretty locked in and there may be 
factions. So I want to speak for the amount of resource that it takes to unpack conflict that when it's got to this stage and that people need to be realistic about that um, and balance, you know, if a conflict facilitator comes in, the first thing that I would do is to speak to all of the people that are involved. And usually that's an hour, an hour and a half interview one-to-one, which is often a day of my time or, or the best part of a day of my time before anybody gets into the room or we're even trying to set a meeting up. I mean, if, if we're a bit further back, it may be that you're just called in to facilitate a difficult meeting. But if there's a lot of conflict between two people or two parties, then um, for me, that's a really important part of the process. And, and I want to speak for the importance of preparing people to come into that space so that when we're in a meeting together, it has the best possible chance of succeeding or of, of shifting something. You know, we don't even know at this stage what success looks like. Um, and often people are like, whoa, that's, you know, that's a lot. We thought we could just, you know, get it all. And, but actually in that preparation time, um, I feel like what I'm doing with people is uh, – is helping them to manage that shift inside themselves from nobody's listening to me, I feel under threat, I'm fighting for my life or for my belonging in this group, um, I'm fighting for my reputation, for my income, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I'll be seeking to reassure somebody that they can trust me, you know, that I'm not going to be on their side exclusively, but that I'm understanding their position. Um, and that we're going to create a process where they're going to be heard and where they're going to be safe enough to show up. <clears throat> so I feel like I'm doing some basic groundwork to help people's nervous systems come into that room with some reassurance that they're not straight into a war zone and that this person who's responsible for safety and process has listened to them and understands how things are from their perspective. And I would do that for the, for, you know, the different people involved. Um, and I love this word multi-partial, that the, the job of a facilitator is not to be impartial. You know, that's one way of understanding your role. But to be able to take all of the different sides equ equally, you know. Uh, and one of the key first principles of conflict facilitation is that if you can't be multi-partial, you can't facilitate the conflict. So you cannot facilitate conflict where you have a relationship with, with one of the people involved that you wouldn't be prepared to compromise by challenging their position, for instance. Mm. So for me, there are some really fundamental principles that, you know, that's one of them, the ability to be multipartial, um, the importance of doing the preparation work, and part of what I would be doing in those meetings would be tracing back. There was this event, but that's like the, um, the front of a comet. Trailing back in time is a series of other events that led up to the flashpoint. And usually you have to go part of the judgment call for you and the people involved. How far back do we have to go actually to unlock the flashpoint? Because we probably can't start here. So one of the things that I've often done is to agree some sort of timeline and then to say, OK, well, we're going to start here and we're going to unlock this bit first, what happened. And then, you know, then by the time we've got to the flashpoint, actually, we've unknotted enough things that some of the charge has been dissipated. Uh, so I would share with most people those maps that I've mentioned about the different scales and about nervous system states. Um, and if, if there's agreement from both sides to come to a meeting, a key question is, how, what support do you need in order to be able to feel safe enough to be there? And it may be that each person needs a support person who's not there to take, to take their side, just there to support them and to be along, to be with them, you know, not to join in with the discussions. Mm -hmm. um, so all the time I'm trying to put things in place that create a sense of safety so that people actually can be present in their bodies and alive to what's happening in the present moment.
yeah so that's the that's the preparation part yeah. of it mm. uh, and often often if that's not done well enough <clears throat> it doesn't really matter what's hap- what's going to happen in the room mm. so some shift has already usually started and I might ask to do a bit of work with one of those people where we might actually do a whole bit of inner work on what's going on for them in relation to this conflict. Sometimes I've done that. And then something can shift outside the room and the dynamic, you know, often on both sides, mm. where, where there's a much more possibility then for something to shift when we're, when we're together. Yeah. yeah. So um, should I just speak a little bit about what happens in the meeting? I know it's a lot. Yeah. Is that helpful, do you think? Yeah, no, I think I think it really would be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, again, one of the first principles is about safety. And I will have those two maps on bits of paper. One of them, the map of nervous system states, and there's an agreement that if you start to feel that you're getting the charges rising and your body's starting to get really charged, mm-hmm. that there's a safety signal and we say stop or pause. and And anybody can do that, including me, at any time when we start to feel adrenaline going in our systems or shut down or exhaustion or the need for a break. (coughs) And that feels like a really, that there's an agreement that they'll both use that or that everybody can use that. Because I think, uh, yeah, I've said it before on one of these, once we're flooded, once there's adrenaline in our system and we're revved up into that fight flight state uh, or into freeze, we're not in the present moment and we can't shift anything. Nothing's going to change. So, um, so what happens when when the hand goes up? Uh, everybody stops talking. Right. Um, and I might say, let's take a pause. We might even break and go out. Um, and we might just pause. And I would often invite people to come back into their bodies, to breathe, to notice. You know, And if we need a longer break, then we'll take it. So it can take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, um, you know, if we've got to that state. If we can catch it before there's a full flooding, there's the possibility of breathing, coming back, feel your feet on the floor, come back. What can you see in the room um, to this present moment before there's a full kind of amygdala, you know, arousal? Um, But once we're into that, you know... uh, some of the things I've read say it can take 24 hours for those hormones to leave our system. And as long as they're in their system, once our fight flight state is active, we're looking for enemies. You know, we're looking for the danger um, because that's what it's evolved to help us with. What are we running away from or what are we going towards to fight? And that's not a helpful internal state to come into uh, a peacemaking process. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And it does, yeah, it's interesting, you know, the, the mention of hormones because it does often feel so, you know, involuntary and chemical. What, and it is like it's after a certain point, there's a kind of momentum. And it must be, you know, that, that that's the experience of having those hormones yeah. kin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm interested, in, you know, you mentioned those kind of like feet on the ground and what can you see? And uh, I, they often sound really like small, those measures. Um, but I've had experiences of using them and, and you know, really quite profound changes. One, one was um, in a workshop that we were in. Uh, I'd been, we'd, been in we'd been breaking out. I think you were in that workshop, actually. We'd broken out and we were in small groups and then we had to come back into the big circle. And for me, this was a group of people I didn't know. And someone was going to have to report on this quite complex conversation that we've just been part of and that, there was no way I was going to do that but we then broke and did some embodiment kind of practices and when I came back into the circle I found that I was completely relaxed about the idea of feeding back and so it was it was so unexpected mm. that shift in me that it was it was quite profound um, and what we had done hadn't been a really big deal it had been this kind of feet on the ground you know looking at what you can see and I think they're they're much more powerful than they seem those um what what are they those what do you call those kind of um practices uh 
I, I don't know. Some of them, are, I think, are kind of parasympathetic, activating. So, you know, uh, deep breaths, breathing out, sighing. Um, but, you know, physical touch, you know, some of these that are just soothing practices, um, which just helps to bring the sympathetic arousal down a bit. Uh, and, and another way of understanding, you know, like I, I've said before, I'm not a neuroscientist. I, I, I don't know the detail of it. You know, mm-hmm. like you, I know the experience of it. You know, but one of the things that I, that I deeply understand is where, the, where there's that kind of residual charge that isn't proportionate to the present moment. There's somewhere there's trauma, somewhere there's something unresolved um, underneath. And, and part of the nature of trauma is that it exists in the present moment as if the thing that happened in the past was happening right now. Um, and it can lead us to dissociate or just to lose touch with the present and our minds and our inner awareness is back in that past moment when we were alone, threatened, powerless, terrified. And our whole system was on high alert and able or not able, to, you know, usually not able to do anything about it, which is why we ended up with this frozen response in us. Um, so just seeing the wall, feeling the breath, my feet on the floor brings us back to this is the present moment. You know, we're not back there. Yeah. 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 So really, really kind of simple physical reminders yeah. of where we actually are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, David Trelevan's book on trauma sensitive mindfulness, I think, is really good on some mm-hmm. of this stuff. You know, yeah, yeah, how do we come out of that to yeah. be in the present? Yeah. So I could just say a little bit about the process. I mean, I imagine other people will will mm-hmm. say a lot about it, and 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 the process of actually how do people speak to each other? The again, I want to speak. The principle for me is about slowing things down enough and the tendency as our uh you know emotional charge kicks in is to speed up Mm. so a lot of it is about slowing down you know and then simple processes about one person speaking the other person mirroring back this is what i heard not interpreting but just literally and it feels very slow and cumbersome Mm. but we're creating a communication loop that's often got broken this is what i heard yes, you've understood me, or no, you didn't get that bit quite right. Mm. Okay, um, I heard you say this. Is that right now? Yes, it is, or no, it isn't. So we're, you know, it feels really cumbersome, but often this is what's not been happening, is that something's been said and it's been heard inaccurately, and then this has been heard inaccurately, and mm. and it's all gone too, too fast. Um, so we're slowing it down with the stop if you need it, noticing when we hit uh, moments of charge. A chunk from this person mirrored back. Uh, and at the end of it, seeing if this, the listener can make sense, can have a sentence like, it makes sense to me that you would feel, makes sense to me that. So we're also getting a sense of empathy and understanding. And for me, you know, this is, this is fairly standard kind of communication. I don't know if it's NBC, but uh, it's certainly there in Dominic Barter's work, Restorative Justice, um, and yeah, lots of other kind of practices about getting communication to repair. Mm-hmm. And some of the things I feel like I'm looking for, um, I mean, one is clearly underlying needs, which again comes from NVC, nonviolent communication. If we can speak to the underlying need, often we can find a, a more empathic response. And if we can speak our feelings rather than our thoughts and our judgments, that often helps to evoke more empathy and understanding. Um, but one of the things that I'm also interested in is where the two sides are actually really the same. Mm. You know, so I'm not feeling heard, I'm not feeling heard. Wow, so we're in a system where where you're both really not feeling heard by each other, you know, or I'm feeling bullied. I'm, fe- you know, looking for those. And sometimes that can, that can help because it's like suddenly we catch a systemic dynamic and it's not about this person or that person. And some, someone can see, actually, yes, I was being really aggressive then as well. Uh, you know and though anyway so sometimes those moments can be really helpful sometimes they don't come um 
and I and I think the last, you know, so this process of hearing each other, and sometimes there will be these moments of shift. Um, I'll often invite people at the beginning to see if they can say something appreciative to the other, you know, to remember a moment when um, they felt grateful, even if it was a fleeting moment or for something in this process, even if it's just thank you for showing up, having the courage to show up. Um, and again, I feel like these things just help us to remember that there's another relationship that's often just been uh, disappeared when the charge came in. Mm. And I think I think the last thing that I want to say about my job, which is what I've been learning when I do this work, is sometimes your job is not to get anything to resolve. You know, uh, and I can feel the place in me that, that wants there to be a resolution and to work hard, you know, and give it everything I've got. And I think increasingly as I get older and wiser, I feel like, my job is to see if there's enough wisdom in, in the system of the people to find their own resolution. You know, and my job is to be more held back and to invite people, uh, but actually not to do the work myself to try to get a resolution to happen. Mm. And that may mean that, you know, there's less of these kind of sweet moments. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Um, and sometimes I think my job as a, as a, conflict facilitator is to watch and hold a space for a system to completely explode and erupt and for the whole thing to break apart mm. you know and sometimes there have been dynamics that have been contained and contained um, that haven't been addressed and haven't been addressed and actually the system is ready to explode and and my job you know the facilitator's job is just to make that process a bit safer and a bit less damaging for every, for, for everybody or anybody, mm. and that also is quite a thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. someone who likes peace and to achieve things it's quite a thing to accept that that's my job. Mm. Uh, it's not necessarily, a, a, you know, where a system is, maybe way beyond resolution, and actually it's time for this thing to come to an end. Mm. But having holding for that process can still be really useful. And it's so important for that to be for that to be within the realm of the possible when you come into a, a, a conflict. I mean, it's the same with in relationship counsel, counseling. It, it has to be yep. possible for the reality to be that this is no longer viable. Yep. Because if you're invested in it, it, it has to stay together at all costs, and you kind of become part of that system. Yeah. And um, that's you know, if if the truth is not, then yeah, it has to. It has to happen. Yeah. yeah, major deal. I I imagine with more than more than just two people. Yeah, keep it with two, isn't it? It's already hugely complex. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and even with one, <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to acknowledge the intensity of this field, mm. and the you know the skill and depth of understanding that I think we need to step into it. Uh, and and the they for me the whole you know they're probably people that feel competent. I feel generally incompetent and at my edge when I'm doing this work. Um, but I think there's something about the field that you're in that you're in a field with trauma. Um, so I want to acknowledge you know that it is risky and people do get hurt uh, and we need to know what we're doing. Um, and we need to give it time and give it priority. Uh, and and when we're trying to weigh up the kind of, oh, you know, paying somebody's skill to come and give a lot of time and, you know, this isn't for me. It's mm. not my main source of income or source of work. Mm. The cost of the war going on and the amount of harm that's done not only to the organisation, but the amount of re-triggering of trauma and wounding that people experience when there isn't that external holding. Um, and I guess if there was a sort of a plea or, or, you know, a wish, it would be that we would bring in support for conflict early, early in the process. And I know it's very difficult to do that. Um, but to bring in people that are skilled and neutral and not entangled. Um, you know, and I think organisations, you know, XR and other organisations, you know, trying interesting things of can we can we 
help each other's groups with conflicts, you know, we're probably too entangled to help our own. Yeah. And I and I'm just really celebrating all of those efforts that groups are trying to do to put something in place to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. And and tracking right back to all the stuff that you were you were bringing in in session two, which was you know all, all that kind of uh, laying of the ground to to um, build and maintain and nourish relationship. Um, you know, in, in the first place, and so much of this, it, it, it strikes me as it, it feels like a lot of that setup that you were, you were talking about in the kind of early stages of the of the resolution, um, and, and the bringing in of the maps is of kind of is it, is almost educational. It's like these are the this is the territory. These are the kind of skills. These are the kind of attitudes that are likely to help you to be able to navigate this. And and we were talking um, just before we started about maybe bringing that back to ourselves and to to you and your your process with with conflict and how um, you know your own experience of managing your own responses in conflict is likely to be one of the main bits of wisdom that you're bringing here. Um, so I wondered if there was anything you wanted to say about you know what you've learned from from that from from your own process. Thank you. Uh, I, I really like this, this, you know, the, the, this insight, and um, and the and the first, the first step of that is for one person to be able to do this. Um, you know, so acknowledging, you know, I think we said it in, last time. If one person still got ground, there there's usually not or one side has still got ground, there's usually not conflict. It's when we're both in the soup, you know, we're both in the charge place. Um, and there's something about um can we keep a part of ourselves in enough of a witness place even to say, I'm I'm triggered now. Um in my relationship, we we had this stop sign that either of us could use this at any point, mm. and the other person would stop, and we could just get out of the room. Mm. Um, for me, that's a really good idea in a relationship uh, where those charge moments come up. You know, to have some of these safety mechanisms in in place. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm such a facilitator. I would often find myself trying to facilitate the conflicts that I was in. Mm. Um, and I think it happened in organisations as well. And looking back, I would have done less of it mm. because I think it's it, you're constantly undermining your own position when you do that. You can't fully take your own position and hold the space for the conflict to happen. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I that I've learned you know, there's a, there's a good will and a willingness to offer kind of conflict facilitation skills or or just facilitation, process facilitation skills. Mm. But actually, yeah, anyway, you know, there's a, what happens is then the most process aware people are missed from the dynamic itself. Right. It's actually not helpful for, yeah. the, for the thing that's trying to, you know, we talked about the systems trying to update itself. If there isn't another process aware person there to hold process, this you know this person, which often was me, is lost from the conversation or partially lost. Um, and I think that happened quite a lot in transition network. You know, I think I often felt that um, I was trying to facilitate a dynamic that I was trying to be in, mm -hmm. um, and it was very very difficult. Yeah, I can hear, and that that kind of returns to that plea for for, for do it early. In early and don't see it as a source of shame, of shame or failure isn't it like if leaders you know one of the the main things that I wanted in in the organizational in the cultures of organizations I've been in is that the leaders would move towards conflict the, you know and and because of the thing we talked about privilege often they both have the power to avoid it and they have the most fragility and and least amount of skill to deal with the pain or to have the self-awareness or, or the endurance 
um, I was watching something by a, um, a black American guy talking about um, cultural trauma who said, was talking about white and black. You know, white people don't have the stamina to stay in the conversations about race and colonialism. Um, and I think it's a really helpful way of naming that the people with most privilege often don't have the stamina to stay in the difficult conversations. And because they have the privilege, they can avoid them. And it leaves the shit, you know, the crappy dynamics to be held by the people with less privilege in an organisation. And when that's happening, it's it's basically the same culture as in our mainstream system. That's what's happening. <laughs> and, you know, we're putting it into the earth or the water or, you know, the indigenous people or the poor people or the black people or global south, like, or the women or the, isn't it? Mm-hmm. anything but but face into it and grow that strength and stamina for the ones with privilege to face into into the suffering um, and, and and maybe my last word is for me conflict and grief you know if, if we say pain is at the center of what's missing from our culture mm-hmm. as feedback signals that we need to start hearing and listening to you know that's that's where I feel like I've been working you know in a way since leaving transition you know, more in the grief area, but in conflict resolution a bit as well. Because I think they're really, really important places that we stop avoiding. And the more you're in a position of leadership, the more power, privilege you have, please lean into conflict. Don't walk away from it. Please get curious. Please educate and resource yourself. You know, please do what you can to stay in the conversation. Um, even if it doesn't make sense to you and it feels bewildering and, you know, uh, and make space to listen. I think that would be my my final word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Yeah, really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Yeah, thank you. And it's many wonderful conversations. I look forward to listening to others.